How does the brain activity of an autistic individual differ from the average person? Can I determine what type of task you are performing? So this paper discusses the use of graph convolutional networks, which is a type of graph neural network, to analyze fMRI images and classify neurological disorders or cognitive stimuli based on something called functional connectivity. So this new pipeline designed by the research team provides increased flexibility and automation, allowing it to also predict community clustering in the brain and identify biomarkers. How this process occurs can be divided into two main stages. There's a pre-processing stage where we convert the fMRI images into graph input that is suitable for the network. And the second stage is the graph convolutional network itself. But before I get into the details, I'll be going over the data sets that were used in the model. This study used two completely different data sets to build the neural network. The first one was the BioPoint Autism Study dataset that collected fMRI images from 115 subjects, 72 with autism spectrum disorder, and 43 neurotypical subjects as the control group. In this study, the subjects completed the BioPoint light motion test as seen on the left. So in this cognitive assessment, individuals had to identify if the light animations were biological motion or if they were just a random sequence of lights. The second data set, the Human Connecting Project, is a large-scale research project with over 900 subjects that aims to share a deeper understanding of the connections in the brain. The fMRI images were produced when individuals completed seven tasks pertaining to gambling, language, motor, relational, social, working memory, and emotion. What are fMRIs? Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or fMRI, measures brain activity by detecting changes in blood flow in regions of the brain. Using fMRI and other neuroimaging techniques, we can analyze something called functional connectivity. Functional connectivity is defined as the temporal coincidence of spatially distant neurophysiological events. But in simpler terms, we can assume that there must exist a relationship between two regions that have similar brain activity. If we look at this image, we see the brain activity of two regions. Although they're not geographically close, they have almost identical peaks when graphed over the same period of time. Therefore, we can interpret that the two regions are functionally connected. Back to the actual neural network, the first stage is the pre-processing, and this is when we take the fMRI images and transform them into a graph that can be inputted into the neural network. To do this, the fMRI brain scans are divided into regions of interest or ROIs based on existing brain atlases. Next, the fMRI scans are broken into time, individual time steps in order to create time series plots that can then be used to build graphs illustrating the functional connectivity between different ROIs. In total, there were approximately 3,000 graphs for each dataset for a total of 6,000 graphs that were used to train the model. What is a graph convolutional network? In a previous video, I discussed two types of networks, graph neural networks that can make predictions on graph structures and convolutional neural networks that use filters to analyze and extract key features. A graph convolutional network utilizes aspects from both a CNN and GNN in order to extract node features directly from a graph structure, which is extremely useful for node classification. In graph neural networks, an adjacency matrix made up of ones and zeros is usually used to represent a graph, where a one represents an edge between nodes and zero means there is no edge. However, sometimes in graphs, not all edges have the same importance. Some connections are stronger than others. Therefore, we can associate a weight with each edge to create a weighted graph. Instead of using a matrix of ones and zeros, we can use the weight value instead of one. So if we look at this example at the bottom, Node, zero has a weighted, node A has a weighted edge connected to B, C, and D of values 2, 7, and 1, and these are reflected in the adjacency matrix. Furthermore, because the network has these convolutional layers, we need to have features that can be extracted and analyzed. Therefore, we also input a feature vector into the network, which provides additional information about the node. So for the same example at the bottom, the node features we provided were the color and size of each node. Therefore, the entry for node A is green and large. This same concept is used in the brain GNN. 
The graph is constructed of nodes that represent the regions of interest and the edges are assigned a value representing the strength of the functional connectivity between the two regions. The node features that make up the feature vector are the degree of the node, which is equivalent to saying how many edges are connected to each node, and other features including the mean and standard deviation of the fMRI time series and other statistical measures. Now that we have a better understanding of what goes into the neural network, we can discuss what occurs in the layers of the brain GNN. A graph neural network traditionally has three types of outputs, graph level, edge level, and node level. However, this graph convolutional network is unique because it has both a graph level and node level outputs. For the autism spectrum dataset, the final label will identify if the fMRI image is of a healthy individual or an individual with autism spectrum disorder. For the HCP dataset, the final output will determine which of the seven cognitive tasks the subject was performing. Within the neural network, there are two types of hidden layers, and each of these intermediate layers provides a node level output. The first one is a graph convolutional layer, which performs node classification and pro provides information regarding community clustering in the brain. The second layer, called the pooling layer, only keeps the important nodes in the graph, which can be then used to identify biomarkers. The first layer is the convolutional layer that aims to utilize the edge information relating to functional connectivity, as well as the feature vectors from the neighbors and itself in order to cluster similar nodes. If we follow this image, in the first step, nodes are very roughly assigned to specific communities or groups based on where they're located in the graph. Similar to the convolutional filters that build feature maps in convolutional neural networks, kernel embedding is a method that can compare node feature similarities. By analyzing the features of the node itself and its surrounding nodes, the convolutional layer is able to identify communities where nodes are more densely connected to each other than to the rest of the network. Using this information, it is able to update the data associated with each node and cluster similar ones together. That is exactly how we're able to discover brain community patterns, which is critical to understanding co-activation and interactions in the brain. On the right, we see a visual representation of the node features before and after the first convolutional layer. Before the layer, it is extremely difficult to identify clusters of nodes. However, through the kernel embedding, similar nodes are able to aggregate into communities that we can easily identify based on color. This information can be translated into actual clustering patterns in different brain regions as seen on the left. Each color represents a community, and although regions that cluster may not be geographically close, the network identifies that they share similar features or processes. The pooling layer is the second step of the graph convolutional network, and this layer reduces the size and complexity of the graph by selecting and only keeping important nodes, as they are the ones that are more likely to identify and predict neurological abnormalities. This occurs by assigning a score between 0 and 1 to each region of interest. The closer the score is to 1, the more likely the node will be kept. I won't go too much into the math, but the score is determined using vector projection of each node onto a trainable pooling vector. Now, when we look at the graph under no score assignment and the graph under keeping high scores, the only difference is that any node with a score between uh, below 0 0.6 is removed from the graph. This makes it easier to identify important nodes and predict biomarkers because we're essentially reducing the noise created by ROIs that have no effect on the final prediction. First, we will take a look at the ASD dataset on the left. Based on the ROIs identified from the pooling layer, the researchers graph their correlation to functional keywords which are labeled along the x-axis. The blue bars represent the healthy control group and orange bars represent the autistic group. Because the identified ROIs are able to distinguish between the biological processes that occur between the two groups, they are considered biomarkers. We can see that the ROIs that correlate to social communication, visual perception, and comprehension are much stronger in the control group compared to autistic individuals. However, the biomarkers related to memory and default are much stronger in ASD individuals. And just for clarification, default state is defined as the state when you let your mind wander or when you are focused on your inner thoughts. These results are consistent with behavioral observations and theories that believe ASD individuals have greater cognitive strengths, but also more social deficits as they lack awareness of their surroundings. 
Now on the right, which is the human connectome data set, the blue bars represent the correlation between the regions of interest and the given task that is labeled under the bar, whereas the orange bar indicates a correlation between the ROIs and the average of the other six tasks. We see that the blue bars always have a more positive correlation value than the orange bars, which is the desired result. It indicates that the selected ROI is more active when individuals are performing the specific, specified task, which makes it a biomarker. Another unique concept in this network is group level consistency. And what this value does is it regularizes specific aspects of the input data to ensure that they're similar between different individuals. This means that GLC can control if the identified biomarkers are applicable to the specific individual or to the sample group as a whole. If we look at the image on the right, the pooling layer identified 21 of the most important regions of interest for three different individuals, subject 1, subject 2, and subject 3. However, for each row, they altered the lambda value that controls the GLC, where a higher lambda value correlates to higher group level consistency, and they circled the most commonly detected areas between all three individuals in light blue. So if we start at the top layer, where the lambda value is zero, indicating a no GLC, there are no circled regions, meaning that the three individuals did not share a single region of interest or biomarker. Whereas in the last row, where there's a high GLC, we see that there are five regions that are common to all three individuals. Therefore, this network identified that these five nodes or regions of interest are all biomarkers for all three subjects. So both individual and group level biomarkers can give valuable information. For example, individual level allows for personalized treatment preci precision medicine where we're really trying to tailor the treatment to the patient, while group level biomarkers give a clearer understanding of the common characters characteristic patterns associated with a neurological disease. This study believes that they are one of the only ones that are currently designing a neural network that can allow such great flexibility in switching between group level and individual level biomarkers. As most other models can only identify one level of biomarker and must undergo further post-processing to gain further information. This process can really skew the data, so the study believes that their current design can increase accuracy and automation. The last step of the network is to give the final output and accurately identify autistic individuals from the healthy control for the ASD dataset or to classify which of the seven cognitive tests was conducted for the HCP dataset. So how well did the brain GNN perform? When comparing the brain GNN to other existing models that analyze the same dataset, the brain GNN improved accuracy between 3% and 20% for ASD classification and achieved an average accuracy of 93% for the HCP dataset. It consistently outperforms most of the other models in both datasets and has a smaller error range, which is why the study believes that this type, type of pipeline should be further utilized not only for fMRIs but for other neuroimaging techniques as well. The brain gen -N is also able to operate on a smaller dataset compared to many of the other models. The red values at the top indicate the number of trainable parameters where the more parameters there are, the larger the data set must be. Due to the complexity of fMRI images, you usually need a large number of parameters in order to perform accurately. However, the brain GNN has 41,000 uh, parameters for the ASD data set and 96,000 for the HCP data set. Although that's still more than some of the other models, the Brain GNN has managed to reduce number of parameters compared to models such as the MLP or Brain CNN without sacrificing on performance accuracy. And that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about a practical application of graph neural networks. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe.